So welcome everyone. I want to welcome you all to our Valparaiso University class on religion, spirituality, and global health. I'm Professor Susan Holman, and our audience today includes the students in the regular class, as well as a small group of other VU students. We've opened this session to others at VU since we today have an invited guest speaker, Dr. Christiana Zenner. During the session, I will um, monitor the waiting room to let you in if you accidentally lose connection. And you may also use the chat function for questions or and for discussion uh, during the discussion section. So Dr. Christiana Zenner is Associate Professor of Theology, Science, and Ethics in the Department of Theology at Fordham University in the heart of New York City. She's also affiliated with Fordham's Environmental Studies and American Studies programs. Dr. Zenner earned her BA in Biology at Stanford, followed by doctoral studies in religion at Yale. Her research focuses on freshwater ethics as it intersects with ecological theory, religious ecologies, earth science, and the ecological turn in Catholic social teaching. She's spoken on national and international media, including Public Radio International, The Washington Post, TED Ed, and MSNBC, among others. Her articles are published in journals on Christian ethics, feminist studies in religion, Catholic social thought, and moral theology. Dr. Zenner is the author of a book that our class recently read, Just Water, Theology, Ethics, and Global Freshwater Crises, and co-editor on two volumes about sustainability and bioethics. We're delighted to welcome her here today. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for having me, Dr. Holman. It is a real delight to be invited. And as I noted, as, as Dr. Holman and I were chatting before the session, um, she has just a fantastic job title and such an amazing opportunity to have these interdisciplinary conversations about how humans in the world experience bodily reality and spirituality and health. And I'm really actually kind of jealous of all of you of getting to be in her class because she is wonderful and talented. So uh, I am here today to speak about Just Water, which as many of you know from being in the class is this text. This is actually the second edition of the book that uh, I believe you read this edition. Yeah. Okay. And uh, it was published in 2018, the first edition having been published in 2014. And what both of these volumes tried to do was to explore the complexities in thinking about, in thinking about water. So uh, complicating our assumptions of what kind of thing water is, thinking through some of the challenges to fresh waters in the current day, the present moment, and then envisioning what resources might be looked into, especially from Catholic uh, theological traditions, the tradition of Catholic social teaching, which is a heavily ethics inflected, justice inflected tradition. And then also extending into some questions of Christian spirituality, as you may have noticed in the later chapters. So it's a book that changed a little bit in between 2014 and 2018. And that's substantively because Pope Francis came on the scene. So granted, he was elected to the papacy in 2013. And when you publish a book, you submit it to the publisher a long time before it actually comes into print. So he was elected to the papacy pretty much about two weeks before I sent off this entire manuscript. And so the first edition had like three lines about Pope Francis. And I said, you know, I think that this trajectory will continue with Pope Francis and the Catholic Church. I think these teachings will just develop further. He's chosen this name named after St. Francis, who was known for communing with the birds and the wolves. He's obviously committed to issues of addressing poverty as a structural reality. And ecology is a really natural fit. So let's see what he does. And then he came out with this encyclical Laudato Si. Hence the second edition of the book that delves more into uh, how, how hydrological thought in the Catholic Church has developed, if we can think of it that way. 
So I've put the just in the title in scare quotes because the publisher wouldn't let me put it in scare quotes in publishing an actual book, but that is how I think of it. It's a pun. I'm relentlessly punny, if not always funny, at least punny. And so the just is a reference to the kind of diminutive, oh, no big deal, it's just water. What, are, what is there to think about? But it's also in reference to the idea of justice. When we think of just as an adjective, what does that look like? And how do we think about water in this regard? What I'd like to start out doing is actually beginning with a pope's, beginning with a poem. And that will lead us into a, an invitation to talk about how you sense, how you define, how you think of water, what kind of thing it is to you. If asked, how would you describe it? Uh, and we'll do that in breakout groups in a moment. So I'm just giving you slightly advanced warning. This poem is called Water by the mid 20th century poet, Philip Larkin. If I were called in to construct a religion, I should make use of water. Going to church would entail affording to dry different clothes. My litany would employ images of sousing, a furious devout drench, and I should raise in the east a glass of water where any angled light would congregate endlessly. What I'd like to invite all of us to do then in breakout rooms of about five people each, some cases maybe a little fewer, is to, you know, if you don't know each other, say, hey, say your names. And also to say, if you were called in to describe what kind of thing water is, if you had to define water for yourself or to someone who wasn't quite sure how to think of water, maybe someone from another planet, maybe someone who's never thought about uh, this kind of question and reflection before, what would you say about it? What are your first associations? And how would you describe or define it? So. If as you do that, you can have someone just take a few notes on what ideas come up, you know, may have to do with H2O, may have to do with lakes, who knows, write down all of those things in your groups, and then we'll bring that back to the main session. If you have extra time in your groups, I'll give you about five, six minutes for this. If you have extra time in your groups, what you can do is notice where your descriptions align, where they overlap, and where they diverge and what's going on there. Make sense? So what is water? How would you describe or define it? And then if you've got time, where do those descriptions or definitions overlap and where do they diverge? Go for it. All right. Dr. Holman, do you think we're mostly back now? I think we're all back now. Awesome. Okay, great. So 60 positive cases in one day, Joe Castleman. Holy moly, that's a lot. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a time. Um, okay, so what, this is a little bit of an experiment. What I would like us to do, I'm going to stop the share for a moment just so I can see all of you in a different way. Um, you can use the chat or you can use your voices, but I would love to hear from, anyone in the group, including but not limited to the note taker, uh, what ideas and associations of water, what definitions and descriptions you came up with, or what reflections you had on what, what was surfaced in your groups. So that can be the, the first order response to the question, and it can be the second order reflection on the question. So uh, that can again be in the chat or verbally. And verbally, um, I'll see if I can see your hands. And this is what I just asked my students to do, and it's imperfect, but it's a nice way of being human. If you just kind of wave your arms or one arm madly like this, then I'll try to see it. Or you can try to raise your little hand in the reaction function. And maybe Dr. Holman can keep an eye on, on who might like to speak there. And if you don't want to speak at all, put it in the chat. I saw Victoria Camerano. Okay, go for it. 
Yeah, we started by saying like we just started with it's a basic human need and that like you have to drink water to survive. But then we built on that by saying like you also need water to produce food and you also need water to produce clothing. And it's also used a lot in just infrastructure in general, just building things. So um, you could just like you could relate it to pretty much everything that we need in order to be alive and to be humans in this type of world that we live in. Great points. Thank you, guys. Uh, Faith Briars. Yeah, so kind of um, what we started with was the idea of like human need, like Victoria was saying. And then um, I talked about like destruction and renewal. And we talked about how some areas are surrounded by water that we can't use as renewal because it's not viable, um, but also that it gives us freedom to travel and get those needs. Um, and then the reflection of that kind of like what Nell said in the chat was that um, water is both like renewing and destructive, um, both on the physical sense and also on like a spiritual sense, as we've seen through like biblical stories, um, stuff like that. So that's kind of what my group talked about. Great, you guys. And thanks for referencing the great comments in the chat too. Dakota. Uh, my group kind of went a different route. We talked a lot about it as like a chemical substance, like it's um, like H2O, it's chemical composition, it's a molecule, um, it can be like a liquid, a solid, or a vapor, but then we also talked about the way that it like changes, like it's good for our body when it's in a pure form, but someone in our group mentioned how like the water here at Valpo is really hard, so unless you like put it through a Brita filter or something, it just doesn't taste or feel very good. Um, and then the way that like we taint it with pollution and um, littering and stuff like that too. Awesome, thank you guys. And let's see, I'm seeing Sky Sher Sherwood's group chat, the water being a moving flowing resource and the notion that it's always available to us at all times because it's flowing from the sink, whether or not that's true of reality. Uh, it, sorry, true in general of everyone's reality. Um, you know, plumbing. Plumbing is a pretty solid human rights issue in a lot of parts of the world. Molly Fulton, do you have your hand up? Yeah, Go I ahead. just had this thought. It's always been really um, fascinating to me, the fact that like water in and of itself can serve as like an entire ecosystem for an abundance of different organisms. And that's always really, really neat too. And obviously those organisms are at risk when they're um, and of our ecosystem is being polluted, so. That's great. That's a lovely image and truth at the same time. Thank you for that. Well, let me share the screen again. And um, I, I didn't fully, obviously, uh, anticipate all the rich ways that you would weave in your insights from things that you've thought and talked about already and what you talked about in your groups. But I offer you this slide just as a way of saying that what water is depends on the lens from which we're looking at it. And many of these things can be true at the same time. Scientifically, it's a marvelous manifold molecule, polar tetrahedral, hydrogen bonds, all kinds of amazing shape-shifting capacities and phase change capabilities. Economically, it's a commodity, but imperfectly so, but it is certainly something that is uh, presumed to be ownable in some political economic cultures and thus uh, priced and traded and sold. Ecologically, a lifeline of ecosystems and species. Cosmologically, a substrate of life. Culturally and religiously, now just cramming this all in there together, a repository of symbolism, meaning, value, ritual, many, many ways of relating and ritualizing uh, human beings and environments. And then demographically, water is variously distributed or accessible. So for those of us in parts of the US where water flows freely from our taps every day, it does seem to have this inherent flow quality constant presence. But for folks who live in more arid parts of the country or parts where wells are running dry or Native American reservations or Houston and other parts of Texas when the pipes freeze up, it is something that is variously distributed and contingently accessible 
depending on how good the infrastructure is and the sense of whose responsibility it is to provide water. One way I think about this and, and talk about it in the book is it's universal in particular. So water is universal. Yes, of course, it is H2O. Yes, of course, we all need it for life. Ecosystems need it, humans need it. We all recognize it when we've got it, but it also always has these particular qualities. There is no such thing as kind of a, an ideal concept of water that water always is in every context. You know, like, um, the point about Valpo's water being hard water, you know, that's shaped by the geological formations through which water runs and then how it's filtered and then various other things. And so water takes on the characteristics of its environment and also shapes us in turn. So universal in particular, I also now, this is a difference between the first edition of the book in 2014 and the second, I refer to both freshwater and freshwater crises, not in the singular, but in the plural. So I now talk much more about freshwaters plural and freshwater crises plural, because while it is the case that there is this universality, this kind of singular truth or set of truths by which water can be experienced, described, and relied upon, it's also the case that it's really hard to describe any one thing as the true form of water or the true freshwater crisis. So what does this have to do with justice? Well, as, as some of your brainstorms alluded to and some of the comments I just made alluded to as well, water is, this is fancy Latin speak, sui generis and sine qua non. And I talk about this a little bit in the book, meaning Water is distinctive, it is non-substitutable, it is sui generis, it is unique, it is of its own, in its own category. And sine qua non means that it is a baseline. It is a, a literally without which nothing. Pretty much in every frame that you can think about it, water is a without which nothing kind of thing. And so I say in the book, I think this makes water something that is really important for ethical reflection. I think I makes, it makes it a substance that is an ethical or a moral substance. And when I say moral in this context, I tend to refer to the moral traditions that are within specific cultures or religions. When I say ethics, I tend to think to be meaning um, broader philosophical or global debates about water, but there's, there's a lot of interweaving. So because it mediates relationships, because it is sui generis and sine qua non, I think water is a moral substance or a substance that deserves moral consideration. And this is anthropocentric in some ways. That is, its conditions, it provides conditions of human functioning and flourishing, but it's not only about the human, of course. There are many other ways of being in the world beyond the human that rely on fresh water too. One thing I wanted to note from the book that we might choose to talk about in discussion more fully, that's up to you, is that there are lots of variables in freshwater scarcity. And so this is really summarized or explored in more detail in chapter two. Chapter two was written as a way to get people kind of on the same page about what is it that we're talking about when we're talking about water crises? And what kinds of patterns and flows are freshwater subject to? And what kinds of things create scarcity? So there's physical scarcity, which is parched landscape, very arid climate, not a lot of groundwater, not many lakes or rivers. There's also various forms of socially mediated scarcity that we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, now I can't see the title of my slide because of the, <laughs> the toolbar. Okay. Um, and again, coming back to that point, is there such a thing as the global freshwater crisis? If you step back and you take a really, really like astronaut's eye view of the planet and you try to envision the planet as a whole, yes, planetary thinking can help us see that there is I suppose such a thing as 
a singular freshwater crisis, which is that fresh waters are not always in the places that humans want them to be, and that they are being extracted often, most often by humans at really unsustainable rates. But again, when we start zooming in and coming down to more tangible levels of scale, we see that it's hard to use a planetary or a universal definition for conditions that manifest very particular realities. So water is unevenly distributed physically, that's physical scarcity. It's unevenly consumed and unevenly used. Um, and that is the more social aspect of scarcity. Now, why Pope Francis? Why Catholicism? Well, on the one hand, it's useful for your class because of your class's title, which involves various forms of religion and spirituality and health. In my case, uh, maybe I'll go back and tell you a little bit about how I came to be interested in this topic more generally. And it was pretty straightforward. It was that I had done my undergraduate work in biology uh, and a pretty interdisciplinary form of biology where we looked at human ecology, we looked at psychology, we looked at geology, and as well as the biological cell related sciences. And one of the things that I really found fascinating had to do with bioethics and how people understood what the human meant. So looking at these basic terms like the human or water. Um, and I worked for several years in bioethics and eventually thought that, you know, these issues are so important. And while philosophy is such a valuable analytic tool, what I'm really interested in are the different ways that people talk about ethical issues like end of life care or environmental ethics from cultural traditions and the kind of depth and richness that they bring to those. And so I started noticing as I was in grad school and reading and thinking about the Catholic moral tradition as a very particular set of modes of moral reasoning, I started noticing that from about the year 2000 on, papal documents started to refer to water with increasing frequency. And I thought that was both surprising and interesting. Surprising because no one had written about this that I had read and interesting because it seemed to me as someone who grew up in the arid Western part of the United States, it seemed to me to be such an important, obvious link between social well being, economic well being, and environmental well being. And so I ended up writing my dissertation on these topics. It was called Valuing Water. So it looked at different modes of understanding what water is and, and how its value uh, derives from that. And uh, the chapter on Catholic social teaching, I just felt like it just kept giving me a lot to think about. There are two encyclicals, um, sorry, one encyclical prior to Pope Francis's, two total, that now address water issues. Um, but there's, there's really nothing that compares to Pope Francis's treatment of it in Laudato Si. So how does Pope Francis invoke water in Laudato Si, which is this 2015 encyclical on ecology. Um, an encyclical, as you may know, is an authoritative document issued by a Pope that talks about matters of uh, economic, social, political, and now environmental concern when we're talking about the Catholic social teaching tradition. Encyclicals can talk about lots of other topics from theological and clerical vantage points, but in the tradition of Catholic social teaching, they have to do with uh, economy, society, politics, environment. Pope Francis is, is the first one to, to centralize ecology, and he understands ecology as referring not only to the environment, but also to the caliber of our relationships with the environment, with one another, and with God. And water figures prominently. It's invoked in the first chapter, and it comes up subsequently. So how does it come up? It comes up with reference, and, and this resonates with some of the comments you guys made earlier, uh, that, that water really is a foundation for so many different types of things, for agriculture, for industry, for domestic uses. 
Uh, he speaks about water poverty and people who do not have access to sufficient amounts of clean, fresh water and how this is a problem and that a debt is owed to them by people in super developed nations because of this inequity. Uh, he talks about unsafe water, polluted water, as some of you mentioned, and effects especially disproportionately on the poor and on women. So there is an intersectional reality going on here. He doesn't mention race explicitly, but questions of poverty, questions of gender figure very prominently into his reasoning on water. He notes that he is skeptical, as did his predecessor, Benedict XVI. Uh, Pope Francis is skeptical about the commodification of water. He doesn't like that water is subject to market forces and to profit when so many people don't have enough to live out their basic daily functions, when so many people don't have plumbing and infrastructure. Um, and so he talks about water as a universal human right. And Pope Francis here is working out of a tradition that sees human rights to water as opposed to the commodification of water. There's a lot more potentially to say about that, but that's where Pope Francis is coming from. And then he also notes, and, and follows this up in a 2017 speech he gave, he notes that water may be a possible source of conflict. Ever since the 80s, world leaders have been saying things like, wars of the future will not be fought over oil, they'll be fought over water. Now the truth is probably all of the above, but hopefully some of that can be forestalled. And water certainly has been a source of conflict, more commonly, it has been a factor in conflict. So Pope Francis doesn't go into this in his encyclical, but uh, the ways in which drought decreases agricultural fertility, reduces people's livelihoods and ability to survive, fosters the need for people to move into the city and leave their farmland, has been shown to contribute to social unrest and uprisings and um, in, in a number of parts of the world already. So uh, political scientists refer to water, especially water scarcity as a threat amplifier, threat amplifier. Okay, so um, I think one or two more conceptual tools I wanna give you before I stop talking and we open the floor for conversation is this really lovely term, I call it important jargon because it does sound very academic, the hydro-social cycle. If you guys think back to fourth grade and or maybe those conversations at the start of class about what kind of thing water is, some of us may have said, well, you know, it's a uh, the hydrological cycle, like water exists in these multiple phases and rotates throughout different parts of the environment. And the term hydrosocial cycle is playing on that idea of the hydrological cycle. So the hydrological cycle notably doesn't include human beings, really. It's just about water, what water does with geological life forms and the, sorry, geological forms and the ocean and trees and fauna and so forth. Uh, so here's the quote. The hydrosocial cycle is a way of representing the deepening entanglement of flows of water and social power relations. Unlike the scientific hydrological cycle, consideration of the hydrosocial cycle makes it impossible to abstract water from the social conditions that give it meaning and from the people and the societies through which it flows. So the approach that we're taking in this class that I take in my book and my work is one that recognizes hydrological realities, but also takes a hydrosocial and indeed an ethical approach. In the book, and just noting here, there are a number of places where we can see hydrosocial realities coming in. Again, recalling the hydrosocial cycle um, is the entanglement of flows of water and social power relations, we can think about Flint, Michigan, for example, and how decisions to change water sources from one river to another polluted river have ended up having incredibly deleterious impacts on the public health of an entire city 
in ways that are racialized and in ways that impact future generations, brain development, neural development, well-being, and so forth. And so these are images, of course, of what's coming out. Uh, this is from, I believe, CNN. Um, what's coming out of a fire hydrant and then also lines of people waiting for bottled water when they couldn't, and in some cases still cannot, you safely shower or bathe or drink or cook with the water from their fossils. Another example of hydrosocial interactions, who has the water, who has the power, is at Standing Rock, North Dakota. And a chapter in the book, as those of you know who read it, is about putting Laudato Si in conversation with Standing Rock. And I think this picture is particularly potent symbolically for a number of reasons. Um, this was an event in early December 2016 uh, when the water protectors uh, had a water-based attack, altercation, from the um, state guard and the hired mercenaries that had been hired by the Dakota Access Pipeline Company. And, you know, water hoses being used against nonviolent protesters are reminiscent of Bull Connor and his use of water hoses against those who were nonviolently demonstrating for civil rights and for an end to segregation in the 50s and 60s. So the use of hoses has a long history. Water here can be used as a weapon, right? So it's not always only life-giving. And it was winter in the Dakotas, so it was freezing temperatures. So there's a lot of, of pretty blatant aggression in this kind of image and that kind of action. At the same time, there's a layer of painful irony because what the people gathered at Standing Rock described themselves as doing was protecting the water. Mini Washoni means water is living, waters are living. And they described themselves in what some people viewed as protests as water protectors, with their role being to protect the water from the risk of oil spills that flow from the um, Dakota Access Pipeline going through ancestral lands. And so there are so many layers of how water is understood to function, how it can be used as a weapon, who gets to decide how the waters flow, or what kinds of uh, pipelines cut through them. And for the Lakota people gathered and allies gathered at Standing Rock, it was explicit that water is an entity deserving of respect and protection. So water is not only something that should be protected for human use, but from a different religious worldview than say the Western worldview that allows water to be seen as extractable and commodifiable, water is more like a relative, something to be protected. All right, I'm going to move through this quickly because it just underscores an insight of what we've been talking about. What we're talking about are patterns of relationship and which conduce to flourishing and which don't and how fresh water figures into that. Um, so this is where I'd like to wrap up the part of the conversation where I talk extensively and invite us to have a conversation that can be as wide ranging or as focused as you would like. I know that, uh, let's see, Vicki and Carson posed some really great questions in advance that you used, those of you in uh, Dr. Holman's class used to prepare. One of the things that is fantastic about waters, plural, and about freshwater, singular, is that it really lends itself to what I call moral imagination. What kind of thing is water? 
How should it flow? How do we know? How is it represented in literature, in economics, in law, in anthropology and the study of different cultures, in religion and theology and sacramental theology? And so something that you can have in the back of your mind, or if you'd like to return to it explicitly in our conversations is where do you find yourself in this conversation? Because the fact of the matter is when we're talking about water, just like when we're talking about ethics, we all begin from somewhere. None of us are just kind of objective amorphous brains and bats. We all have experiences that shape us, that shape our perception. And so we're all biased in certain ways. Sometimes as with implicit bias on race, that can be an enormous problem. Sometimes the bias is part of being human. You know, my experience of water growing up was shaped by growing up in California and Colorado. Coming to the East Coast in my 20s was like, whoa, this is a completely different world. People don't have sprinklers because it rains this much. This is crazy. So that's, you know, that's a basic example. But as I have gone through my career, it's, it's just fascinating and so important to hear how people from different fields of study, different parts of the country, different cultural traditions regard and understand water. And there is something to be said and explored vitally, no matter what your field of study, when we're talking about water and its connections to justice, and in the case of your class, also to spirituality and religion and health. So I thank you very much for having me. I am very excited to engage in whatever way is most helpful in our conversations next. And I'm delighted that we've got um, just under 30 minutes, I think, right, Dr. Holman? Yeah. So at this point, I'm going to stop the screen share and we can open up a conversation in a broader way. That can be, of course, if you wanna say something, that's great. Um, if you want to note it in the chat, also great. One thing that I, um, that I try to do in my classes, so I mean, you guys and I just met and we're all in this Zoom pandemic reality thing. <laughs> um, but if you see someone else waving their hand and you want to call on them directly, that would be fantastic because while I did literally write the book that you read, there's also a lot of insight and ideas around here that I think your peers, probably what you say, will elicit responses from your peers. So you can also respond to one another. And I, I, I don't always say this, but we can try it now. If you're really feeling it, just jump in, politely jump in, but you can unmute yourself and jump in. Um, just because, you know, like if we were in a classroom, you could kind of see who was leaning in and going like this, and we can't always see that when we're over Zoom. All right, let's start with, I see Joe, I see Victoria. Why don't we start with Joe, go to Victoria, and then you guys can distribute from there. Awesome, yeah, um, well, thank you very much. Um, so I was wondering, you know, in your book, you talked about how small acts like just turning off the water while you're brushing your teeth or taking shorter showers, um, really don't make that much of an impact, you know, in the big scheme of things. So, you know, we are individuals and, you know, I think we all feel more passionate about it after, um, you know, having heard the discussion and uh, reading the book. So what can we do as individuals? Is it like avoiding, you know, eating a lot of that red meat and like certain clothing brands that are bad or, or like advocacy or what are your thoughts about how the individual can get involved? Okay, I'm totally going to respond to this one directly because thank you for the direct question. Um, yeah, this comes up all the time and I struggle with this and I need to write an article about this because it is so real. Uh, individual action and especially domestic uses, reforming those will not necessarily solve water crises in a planetary sense. There's no way, given the industrial and agricultural use. But as you've rightly pointed out, there are some things that do make a difference, especially nationally or regionally or within a given kind of system. So our food system is highly internationalized in the United States, a little bit differently so in the pandemic, but 
uh, <laughs> what I would say here is to know your sphere, two things. One, uh, individual choices have the benefit of forming habits. And habits, when good habits, can also be thought of as virtues. So mindfulness about the individual decisions you're making can be a form of exercising water virtue because it brings to mind that you're making the best choices you can as an individual. And sometimes if you talk about it with other people, whether it's Thanksgiving and you know, you're talking about why you don't drink bottled water, if you have a good water supply, all those kinds of things, sometimes that can have a, an effect on other people as well. The second thing I would say is about your sphere of influence. And this is a little bit of, it's a little bit related to that last slide and exhortation I had up, which is namely, know where you can make the best kind of impact. For some people that might be donating to a really good organization and tweeting about it, posting about it on Instagram, whatever. For other people, if you decide to become a lawyer or an economist or a poet, bringing attention to these matters and helping people to think more critically and constructively about these matters is a very good way forward. But because there is no single answer to global freshwater crises, because there is no single global freshwater crises, we need to get out of the mindset that there is a solution and into how do we participate in identifying problems, asking better questions and constructing better futures which is an ongoing task. I'll just tell you, probably my biggest moral failing, well, my daughter might say other things, you know, who knows, but uh, is, especially from a water-based perspective, is that I'm not a vegetarian. And I think the single most impactful thing that a person from a high consuming nation like the United States can do is eat a non-water intensive diet. There are lots of other things, clothes that are not as water intensive as you rightly pointed out, um, advocacy, but in terms of actual water consumption individually, that is the clearest way forward. I don't eat a red meat heavy diet, but still. Uh, Victoria, Victoria, Molly, and then it looks like Monique's got a comment in the chat. So let's go with, maybe let's go in that order. And then peeps can jump in. Okay, yeah, sorry, I have another direct question and also a little bit of like a lead in into it, sorry. But um, I was just like caught by something you said at the very beginning of uh, your lecture when um, you brought up that you couldn't add the quotations to the title. And then I was thinking about how this topic could be viewed kind of in a controversial light because it could be an economic issue, it could be a social justice issue, it's an environmental issue. So I was just wondering if there was anything else that you wanted to include in the book um, that you couldn't, or if there was something that your publisher or editor wanted taken out of the book and you wouldn't let them, or if there was just anything else that... Uh, you know, was, I guess, under scrutiny from other people other than yourself? That's a fun question. I had the great benefit with my editor of, um, and the publisher of them being very on board. So even though this was a book, unlike most that they had published before, um, they gave me a lot of leeway, which is good. It was a book written for tenure, which as you guys may know, is the process by which faculty are given uh, job security for various durations of time. And usually in the humanities, what that means uh, is that in order to achieve that, you first have to apply after your PhD and be accepted into a tenure line job, which are decreasing 
given financial cuts and, and challenges to ways of governing the university in a new neoliberal milieu, but that's not our topic for today. Uh, so then you often have to meet certain standards in terms of teaching and service and research, and often in the humanities that includes publishing a book. So what you wanna do in that book is show what your ideas are and how they engage with the tradition and also how they're distinctive and important and contribute to scholarly conversations. And so I, you know, I wouldn't say that there was anything that I was encouraged to keep out of the book, but I was very, very attentive to the fact that there were multiple audiences for this book. So my tenure committee, for example, was, was one audience. So much so that what is chapter two, the primer on the global freshwater crisis was actually going to be chapter one at first, because I thought, well, if I'm talking about water, I should start out by talking about, you know, questions people have about water. And then I thought, oh, wow, but wait, I'm in a theology department. I can think of several colleagues who will think, what on earth? Why is she just starting with water? I need more of a justification as to why this is something that in a theology department, someone should be writing about. Even though later chapters of the book do that anyway, I felt like it needed foregrounding and a kind of justification and invitation to the more theological types at the beginning. So those are, you know, there's a there's a frame and an angle and an audience for every book and those were part of mine. But another thing that was really important to me is that I really wanted people to be able to read and connect with the book who weren't only scholars. Because the issue is so important or sorry, who who aren't many people are scholars independent of their career or you know what they end up being for their job or, or doing in their life. Um, independent of professional scholars who do this all day long for their living. Uh, because there are so many thoughtful, critical, constructive, engaged people. And uh, it just seemed really important to me to write something that was at least kind of interesting and hopefully prompted conversations. Thanks for your question. The, the, oh, the one more thing I'll say is that I do, when I show up at meetings like the um, American Association of Geographers or the International Studies Association, I do get some weird looks sometimes like, you're in a theology department and you write about water? What? Um, and I've had people think that I was a nun because I teach in a theology department. So, you know, there's just different, which I'm not for the record doesn't matter one way or another, but, you know, just to be clear on professional affiliations. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting, being someone who works within theology and religious studies and writes about water and cultural values and spirituality and ethics is definitely not the norm in the world of water and public policy or environmental policy. It's become a little bit more normal, but it's still a little quirky. Thanks for asking the question. Molly, you've had your, your digital hand up for a while. Yeah, so um, my question is a little bit more, I guess, opinion-based, but I just was wondering in your opinion, um, do you feel that humans have like learned or evolved to take basic life-giving resource like water for granted? Or do you think that that is more just like a part of the human condition, like, kind of like just a part of our natural biology, I guess, and psychology? That's an interesting question. Um, do you mind if I toss that one back to you? I'd be interested to hear what you and your peers have to say on that one. Yeah, so um, when I'm thinking about it, I don't think that like, I think that past generations obviously viewed water way more sacred than we do maybe now especially in terms of like us as Americans living in America um I think it I would lean more towards like it's something that we've learned because my my discussion group and I talked about how uh some nations have got us included have become so comfortable that um we're taking things like water for granted and while other nations are going almost completely without it. So I would I would lean probably more toward, towards like, we've evolved towards this point. 
but evolved in a cultural evolution sense, it sounds like, in, in the way that cultures and political economic assumptions shape the way we understand water as a resource instead of, say, as a relative. Yeah, yeah. Would anyone else like to weigh in on that important question or, or anything that's been said previously? Yeah, I feel like society has sort of this like mass consumption mentality, especially in America that I feel, feel like wasn't always there. Like I think back to even times like the Great Depression where people were rationing things. And I feel like, you know, there's different periods in time when people need to conserve. But then I feel like as like technology advances, there's just so much more mass consumption. So I feel like what Molly said, it kind of, it's like a so sociological society, kind of like evolution that you just take for granted because it's sort of what society does. So I feel like your book was really great at sort of bring us back to like, you know, bringing us a grounding and sort of bringing more information about like what we do take for granted and why we shouldn't. Thanks. Monique uh, just added, I think the US waits for economic motivations before taking action on things like that. And economic motivations or crises, public health crises that become visible, like Flint. Uh, you know, and, and Monique, I really like this question that maybe we can sit with for a little bit. In the book, you, de you described water as a human right because it's necessary for life. Have you, I, thought about other survival elements from the same perspective, for example, shelter or food, or we could add air. Uh, how would you add these factors into the conversation on water? Yeah, absolutely true. So this was a, this was a critique I received in um, my dissertation seminar, actually, with, when I was doing the uh, proposal for the dissertation. And one of my very philosophically minded professors said, well, you argue that water is sui generis meaning that it is distinct in its kind and that there's nothing quite like it. But if you interpret that in a certain way, are you saying that it's the only thing that is essential and valuable in these ways? And he said something to the effect of what about food, air? And I said, great point. Uh, I hear where you're coming from in terms of philosophical distinctions, but I'm actually using the term differently, meaning it's sui generis and that it is non-substitutable. It can't be replaced by anything else. Water is, you know, <sighs> I chose it because it's a topic close to heart that um, I felt like was a really important and continues to be a really important and productive site of conversation. Um, I absolutely think that things like shelter or food count as well and, and can be seen very much as a human right within the discussion of human rights. Um, folks like Martha Nussbaum and Amartya Sen have offered various versions beyond a human rights paradigm, talking about, for example, a capabilities approach. So what capabilities are people as people uh, entitled to or deserving of? And what ways can we think about that, you know, how basic goods could be provided, um, what those basic goods would be. Very similar to human rights discourse, in some ways foundational to it, but just a, a different kind of philosophical frame. And, you know, shelter, uh, education is often in there. And uh, these are also important. So there are a lot of conversations on economic, they're called economic, social, cultural rights now in human rights discourse, and they weren't initially in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but they are increasingly in there now. And, you know, one of the ones that seems pretty salient for our context of the pandemic today is access to healthcare, or, you know, just thinking very granularly in our current situation, um, access to vaccines, vaccine distribution, and those kinds of questions. Um, so yeah, I think it's a great point. And, and I, I don't mean to exclude those other kinds of necessities and goods. I would certainly include them as fundamental human rights, but water's, water's my jam. But it's a super important question. Um, let's see, other questions. Oh my gosh, bottled water. Mm. Animal products, yes, unethical farming issues. Okay, I'm just gonna skim through these. 
Yes, um, so Noel, absolutely. Uh, it depends on the mode of farming. So almonds grown in California to make almond milk can be extremely thirsty crops and not necessarily climate appropriate. Whereas animals free range pastured and you know, ethically, ethically um, raised in a number of ways can be better choices, especially if we're talking about bioregional climate appropriate agriculture. So my tendency, it sounds like, like yours would be to be bioregional climate appropriate agriculture, however that might look, but also recognizing that that's not necessarily the way the food system is set up. How does one enter into those points of connection. So these are good points. Um, and yes, more ethical practices tend to be more expensive in a lot of cases. Um, in, some, in some cases, healthier practices also tend to be more expensive. So think about food deserts in certain parts of the United States where there simply aren't grocery stores with green vegetables or non hyper processed foods for a lot of blocks. Um, you know, it's, it's, we do live in a society in some ways where in terms of certain forms of health, it's pay to play. And in terms of the burdens of certain kinds of health and dis-ease, bodily dis-ease, there are economic and racialized dimensions. And one place we see that is often with fresh water. So this brings us to the, uh, to the brands, bottles, questions. Um, okay, so, oh my gosh, greenwashing. Oh, the greenwashing. Are you guys familiar with that term? Okay, so it's a term for advertising or description of products as environmentally friendly, when in reality, not so much. The example that always comes to mind with water is that, and I wrote about it a little bit in the book, is that, gosh, maybe five, six years ago, Dasani, which is um, Coca-Cola's bottled water brand that comes from municipal tap sources and then is filtered and purified in certain ways and given alkaline salts for a certain kind of flavor. Um, Dasani was going through this greening campaign and they reduced the size of the cap ever so slightly. And some of you might remember, like there was this moment where a lot of bottled water companies were making their plastic bottles a little thinner and their caps smaller. And they were like, less plastic, but it's also like still plastic, a lot of it. <laughs> and um, so, you know, that's an example. Um, but I think that the, the bigger point that is being raised by Sky is what about companies that are trying to do something ethical or at least label themselves as doing something ethical in bottled water? So I'm actually in the middle of writing an article with a public policy colleague from Mexico City on this topic right now. So what makes bottled water ethical and what are some ways to think about it? So we've come up with a typology where companies make claims so there's basically two parts of the article. What kinds of claims companies make about the ethicality, the ethicalness of their bottled water versus a more general framework of why, how would he and I, my colleague and I say, this is actually what makes bottled water ethical. So here are the ways that brands talk about their product as ethical. Um, packaging. So either they use less plastic or they use some other kind of packaging that is not as plasticky, that may be kind of more recyclable, but also may not necessarily be. So I'm thinking here of Tetra packs. Um, I'm thinking of, of uh, boxed water. I'm thinking of, there's actually a product called Just Water. Have you guys ever seen or heard of Just Water? So I have some stories about this because um, obviously I wrote a book called Just Water. And that book came out around the same time as the water, as a bottled water product called Just Water. And I was like, come on now, <laughs> what gives? I have a whole chapter talking about the problems of commodification of water. Long story short, 
they are actually one of the more interesting companies who are ethical ish because they pay the municipality from which they take their water they pay six times the municipal water rate and they do a lot of reinvestment back into the community because one of the co-founders is from that town so there's a kind of personal connection and they're trying to do bottled water in an ethical way but you know um another way so that's the first way is kind of packaging or production another way that companies claim that their bottled water is ethical is through um forget what we call it in the paper but basically they do good projects if if you if you buy this bottled water will donate this amount of money to this charity or this kind of project. So kind of like Tom's for shoes, uh, bottled water for that. So the original example of that was Ethos, which is uh, Starbucks now, bottled water brand. If you buy this, then there's an offset by or, a, or an ethical benefit. So buy this product and you'll be doing an ethical deed because you'll be helping someone even if in a really far off way. And then there's the third category, which is the, this is an ethical and important product because it's a good health choice. So there's hint bottled water that they're arguing that they're better for your health than other kinds of sodas or beverages. Um, you know, those, those are really the big three. So production and packaging, um, ethical offsets or social good enterprises, and then this, this question of health. Um, I try not to buy bottled water very much. If I do, I almost never buy plastic single serving. Um, glass, it depends on how far it's shipped because of the fossil fuels. Um, a lot of, but, but you know, plastic, like so much plastic is not recycled. It's either thrown out or downcycled. So I try really hard not to participate in the plastic economy, even though our lives are, of course, saturated in plastic. And um, yeah, the ways that the plastics saturate now our bodies and ecosystems is, is also a really important topic for consideration in these ways. Oh, Sky Dasani was exactly the brand you were referencing in your question. Yeah, I think they had a, a campaign where it, it was like twist loud and proud or something. Just like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've been talking more than I intended to guys. Now we're coming up on time and this is really, really exciting to see these questions. Um, I guess the only question that resin actually, uh, Jillian's come up with a comment too. I was gonna ask about the hard water because Valpo's water is so hard. Any insights you might have about that? But um, let's see what Jillian has to say and, and Nell actually. Yeah, Jillian, we agree about the cringy. Yeah, good, good. So, so what would you say about hard water? Because um, Valpo was my first experience of hard water and it was, you know, I could live with hard water, but um, drinking, it makes you not want to drink the water. So, you know, do you go through a expense a filtering process? You know, is it better to buy, a, is there a good filter that would save problems on that or what? Yeah, I mean, it, it really, so at some point, I think it must've been around like 2012 or 13, I was trying to find an analogy for how to talk about hard water, soft water, alkaline water, you know, all, all the kind of natural but also treated ways that water can appear in our lives. And it was when I was talking to someone at a conference and they were like, ah, oh, the water here in Florida is just so chlorinated. And I was like, oh, water has terroir, just like wine. If you're not old enough to drink, I apologize, but water, is a product of you know the formations through which it flows as well as what we humans do to it and so you know in in terms of um that's taking us a little far afield from the question you actually asked dr holman but but my answer is humans tend 
to like a kind of neutral or slightly alkaline tasting water. So Aquafina Dasani have spent a ton of money researching their particular alkaline salt combination that they put into their water to make it taste a certain way. So some of my students will do bottled water taste tests in class. Some of my students swear they can identify Dasani Aquafina versus tap water. Often they can. Um, the highest level of filtration that people can put in their homes is known as reverse osmosis. And that's a procedure you can put under your sink, you can put in your plumbing system. It's a little invasive to install, but it really does the job. It takes everything out. But then you often need, if you're going to use it for drinking, to put something back in. So like the salts like Dasani or Aquafina do. And so, um, you know, a lot of people like Brita and those kinds of filters. Um, but there, you know, there are lots of lots of ways of thinking about that issue, and um, pa practices tend to be pretty regional. You know, like for example, in New York City, people will use water filters on their faucet. It's much rarer that we use it in our showers. Um, but in other parts of the country, where the water may have different hard qualities that that aren't as friendly to the skin over time or whatnot, people may also do plumbing system filters. And those are generally at the level of the individual household. Thank you so much. Well, we're actually um, at time. So I will uh, invite everyone to thank Dr. Zenner for coming to speak to us and for her time. This has just been an amazing, amazing presentation. So thank you so very, very much. It is my great honor. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Holman and the class and the additional college students who came. You are all great conversationalists and I really appreciate the chance to think with you about these topics. And I will also send Dr. Holman my PowerPoint so that you can post that in whatever ways. <laughs> you like or don't. <laughs>